Yes, it's my great pleasure as Burns Night approaches to introduce Professor Gerard Carruthers from the Center for Burn Studies at Glasgow University. He's an eminent follower of Burns. I'm sure many of you are well aware of him, probably know far more about him than I do, but he has been in the press recently from the Times of London to the National of Glasgow. So he attracts a wide audience and I'll pass you over to Professor Carruthers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Can you hear me at the back? Can, good. And thank you, Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow. An American colleague was reminding me a day or two back that in 1901, the president of your society, Lord Blythewood, owned a Kilmarnock edition. More about that a bit later, but the Kilmarnock edition, Burns' first book, and the copy that he owned was a copy previously owned by Burns' great friend, Gavin Hamilton, so quite an important associational copy. We'll come back to that book as well. I'm going to be speaking tonight about Robert Burns and 18th century thought, and I'm going to range across a number of different areas, hopefully to keep it lively. And those areas, obviously enough, would include philosophy, science to a small extent, and also religious and cultural politics, because none of these things um, are unrelated. I'm childishly proud to be the Francis Hutchison Chair of Literature at the University of Glasgow, and I'll say a wee bit about Hutchison pre presently too, um, but he is a great Enlightenment figure. And one of the first things I'm going to say here that occasionally people find me a bit suspect over is that Robert Burns is an Enlightenment poet. And I want to start by bringing to mind a painting oops, done in 1893 by C.M. Hardy. And this is the painting of the one and only meeting of Robert Burns and a young Walter Scott in one of the salons of Edinburgh, surrounded by the great and good, the literati, the Enlightenment figures of Edinburgh. And it's quite interesting that this painting is done in 1893 at a time when Scotland unashamedly likes Burns, unashamedly likes Scott, and also is very proud of the Enlightenment as one of the golden epochs in its cultural history. The Scottish Enlightenment, though, isn't named as a thing until 1900, when a man called W.R. Scott coins the term in his biography of the aforementioned Francis Hutchison. Within a couple of decades of that painting being made, that painting celebrating Scott Burns and Enlightenment, all of these things begin to lose stock to some extent. And the Enlightenment especially, as the 20th century wears on, in some quarters is seen as Anglo-centric, un-Scottish, and some people in literary criticism who talk about Robert Burns say we've got the Enlightenment on the one hand, the posh bit of Scottish culture, and we've got Burns, the folk bit, sort of, on the other side, and never the twain shall meet. And that is a ludicrous oversimplification, as I'm going to suggest tonight. So I want to hold that painting in mind and perhaps come back to it. So the Scottish Enlightenment, uh, the context in which Robert Burns is born, essentially, in 1759, um, at the high point of the Enlightenment in many ways. Um, it's the very year in which he's born that one of his favourite books is published, to which we'll return, Adam Smith's Theory of Moral Sentiments. But I want to begin a wee bit with Francis Hutchison, who becomes Chair of Moral Philosophy here in 1729. He's an Irishman and he's seen uh, as the father of the Scottish Enlightenment in gender terms that we probably wouldn't salute these days. But Hutchison is seen as the man who opens up Scottish education to Enlightenment. So some obvious points, 
He's one of the first people, instead of lecturing in Latin at this university, as we did in the good old days, he lectures in English. And that is seen as one of the enlightened, enabling gestures undertaken by Hutchison. Hutchison also develops a philosophy of the inner sense. The idea that inherently, put it very generally, we have an instinctive sense of right and wrong. We know this from our conscience or our souls. And Hutchison was a Presbyterian clergyman. But the Glasgow Presbytery attempted to have him done for heresy for these views because they wanted the idea center stage that we rely on faith alone, that hardline Calvinist idea. So it doesn't matter whether you're good or bad, it doesn't matter about your morality, that wishy-washy liberal nonsense, it's all about faith. But the charges against Hutchison are kicked out, and that tells us that to some extent things were changing, although not completely because I've got some good things to say about hardline Calvinism. You weren't expecting that on a, a January evening. But Hutchison's idea of the inner sense, the idea that we apprehend from the soul, that we know good and bad, and we've got an inherent sense of rights. Hutchison is foundational in the modern discourse of rights, of human rights, although the, the, the term human rights really is a, a 20th century invention. But the idea that we know instinctively about things being right and wrong, and it doesn't matter whether we're a Christian or a Hindu or an atheist or where we are in history, according to Hutchison, and the Calvinists really didn't like this, we all have that instinctive inner sense of goodness. And this Hutchisonian philosophy, which is imparted to the likes of Thomas Reed, who develops common sense philosophy, which is a bit similar, I'm not going to say too much about that, and also his pupil Adam Smith, this is part of the soup in which Robert Burns swims. And if we were to take a very small example of that, we might turn, for instance, to his epistle to Davy written in 1785, where he says, the heart's eye, the part I that marks us right or wrong. We know instinctively when things are right or wrong. Each of us has that individual moral agency. And Burns is very much pushing that philosophical idea of inner sense or common sense. Park that one for just now. The bet noir of the Scottish church, much more than Hutchison, was the atheistical philosopher David Hume, the greatest philosopher ever produced in the British Isles. And not only was he an atheist, Hume, for complicated philosophical reasons, was skeptical about our ability to apprehend reality. We think what we see is real. We think we observe, for instance, cause and effect. But David Hume deconstructs all of these things. And he says, to put it crudely, very often our senses our perceptions, a bit unlike Hutchison, are things we can't rely on. And very often we approach things with prejudices or through previous associations. And that idea of prejudice, which becomes a big matter of debate in the Scottish Enlightenment, is something that Burns picks up on, which I'm going to return to. And again, it's channeled through one of Burns's favorite, favorite novels, the greatest Scottish novel of the 18th century, Tobias Smollett's Expedition of Humphrey Clinker, 1771. And this is a novel that riffs on Humean scepticism and says that very often we uh, see the, the world wrongly. My favorite example in the whole book is a bunch of maids are skinny dipping in Loch Lomond and the laird comes along almost twirling his mustache um, enjoying what he's seeing, and the girls are embarrassed, and so they run out of the loch, covering their own eyes. And this is a kind of joke on, by Smollett, on Hume's idea that often we perceive wrongly. And this is an idea that Burns is very aware of, prejudiced perception. The most stupid character in the novel is travelling from England, and she doesn't want to go to Scotland because she's heard that all you have to eat there are sheep's heads. And it takes her 20 pages to work out whether they're sheep's heads 
there must also be sheep's bodies. She's also scared that she's going to drown on the journey to Scotland. She doesn't realise that Scotland and England are not separated by a sea. And the serious point, apart from ideas about prejudice or related to prejudice, being made by Smaller is, after the Union of 1707, if we are to live together in the United Kingdom, then we need to understand one another's cultures. And again, we can do something on this with Burns because that prejudice about sheep's heads takes us all the way to Burns's To a Haggis, which is a comical poem to a large extent, but there's also a serious point being made by Burns that haggis, simple food, is what makes Scotland great, he says. Haggis and porridge, even though he didn't much eat haggis. Oops, I've said it. Um, what Burns is interested in when he writes Ode to a Haggis, a bit like Smollett and Humphrey Clinker, is the idea of primitive conceptions of culture and civilization. And what Burns is responding to, like Smollett, is a kind of English prejudice that the jocks eat vile muck. And Burns turns this on its head and says, it's simple food that makes us healthy and robust. And in a way, he's quite right, because the 18th century is a time when we're beginning to mass produce bread, for instance, and make it artificially white. It's the beginning of McDonaldization and mass consumption of food. So Burns's point about keeping it simple, keeping it real, is quite a kind of healthy point, and it comes out of these Enlightenment debates. Now, my usual joke about sympathy is that Oprah Winfrey did not invent it. It was invented, in fact, by Adam Smith in the aforementioned Theory of Moral Sentiment, 1759, a book that Burns often reads, and he reads also uh, Burns, he also reads Smith's Wealth of Nations. So if you go through the correspondence, you can find him writing to him bosses in the excise and saying, I've been a very good boy. I'm boring up on my economics. I'm boring up on the economy. I'm reading the, the, the wealth of nations. So this is a man, a poet, steeped in enlightenment reading. But the theory of moral sentiments, the book that invents sympathy, um, most ideas are inventions. We tend to think that all kinds of things are natural. Almost nothing is natural. Everything is, is invented. Um, if we want to be quite skeptical, almost in a human uh, way. And the idea of putting ourselves in the place of one another, that idea of empathizing or being sympathetic towards another individual. This is big in the Enlightenment. And you get bits of this in Francis Hutchison. And Adam Smith is the man who really brings it together as a theory. Now, one of the reasons that sympathy becomes a big enlightenment theme in Scotland and elsewhere is big broad brushstroke here, but the 18th century enlightenment to some extent was a reflex against the 17th century where what had we done across Europe? We were all ripping each other's guts out over religion, over scriptural words. We were fighting over abstractions, over what a comma might mean um, in the Bible or where a comma should go. And the 18th century, to a large extent, if we want to explain the Enlightenment in very broad terms, says, can we please put away some of that abstract sectarian thinking? Can we begin, begin to develop universal ideas? This is why the Enlightenment studies um, all kinds of things in encyclopedic fashion. The encyclopedia is an 18th century invention. First of all, in France, for the likes of Denis Diderot, Voltaire, Rousseau. In Scotland, the Encyclopedia Britannica is an invention of the Scottish Enlightenment. And it's about bringing knowledge out into the open, systemizing it, publishing it, and um, saying that everything can be studied rationally. So let's have reason rather than the slaughter of the 17th century, where, my God, were we being unsympathetic to one another? And so, again, sympathy has to be seen against that background. I think that's a St. Valentine's Day uh, massacre in France, but it, it, it makes the point. So the 18th century, it says, can we look at a simpler way of life, a in some ways a less abstract life of the mind, 
uh, where we've got debate over religious ideas. And this partly explains why Robert Burns presents himself as a rustic or pastoral poet. The good life, the simple life, the straightforward life. So it's not just a folk or a popular concept, it actually has deep philosophic roots, that rusticity. And also the verse epistle, which I've mentioned already, the verse epistle to Davy, Burns writes a number of these to individuals where he's talking about politics, the weather, all kinds of things. And poor old Ayrshire thinks they invented the verse epistle. That's what farmers always did. They wrote verse epistles. They were like, no, they did not. The verse epistle comes out of literature, and more than anyone, it comes out of the work of Alexander Pope, who at the beginning of the 18th century is saying, can we do away with fanaticism? Can we be urbane? Can we write verse epistles, polite, conversational poetry that ranges widely over a number of topics? That's the Augustine verse epistle, and that's what Robert Burns gets from Alexander Pope in spades. And there we might notice, nothing wrong with this, a strong English influence in literary terms on Burns. Burns is as influenced by Alexander Pope as he is by his Scots language predecessor, um, Alan Ramsey. So the theory of moral sentiments by Adam Smith, advocating universal sympathy. Um, and we're coming up to uh, a lot of commemoration of Adam Smith professor at this university in coming months. So, you know, do look out for that. And if we want to apply the idea of sympathy to or within Burns' work, we go to one of the most canonical poems, To a Louse. And my usual, my usual way of setting this up is to talk about the central character in the poem, Jenny, who's a babe, a genuine babe, and she knows she's a babe, and she knows that all the men in the church are looking at this babe, but what she doesn't realize is that she, the babe, has got an insect crawling on her. Notice what's going on in the poem. No one's paying attention to the minister or God. Everyone is looking at something they shouldn't be, and no one is quite understanding what's going on. That's the essential comedy. And Burns, in a sense, is saying that's the way we all are. We're all a bit like Homer Simpson. We all get too easily dis dis distracted. We say, yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to go to this lecture, I'm going to listen intently for 50 minutes, or I'm going to go to church and I'm going to extract every bit of the, the marrow of the, the preacher's sermon, and we, do, we don't do it. But Jenny's standing there, not aware of the male gaze and what it represents. They, yeah, they fancy her, but they're seeing something else going on. And Burns is suggesting in that poem, as he berates the louse, why would you berate a louse? It's a dumb creature. He's saying we should remember as human beings that we are part of nature. What do we do, says Burns, or his narrator in that poem? We make up clothes to wear. We make up ranks and class distinction. We take on airs and graces, as he says. We get above our station, and we should remember sometimes that we're part of the animal kingdom. That's part of the message, and that's part of the enlightenment material science, if you like, going on in the poem. The end of the poem, those famous lines, or would some poor the gift of gears to see ourselves as others see us, is Burns riffing on Adam Smith. Adam Smith says it's good to put ourselves in the place of one another, and it's good for other people to see us. And Burns is saying, wouldn't it be good that if we could see ourselves through other people's eyes? And implicitly the answer is, no, not really. <laughs> Because we wouldn't like what we see. So he's influenced by Adam Smith, but he takes that and he makes a joke. So to a louse, Scots language poem coming out of various native traditions, certainly one of those native traditions is uh, Scottish Enlightenment philosophy and especially um, the influence of Adam Smith. Now, one of the ironies of Robert Burns is that um, very often people say, there's the real Robert Burns, or I know what Robert Burns represents. He would have been a nationalist. No, he would have been a unionist. He would have been a Brexiteer. No, he would have been a Remainer, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And people are desperate to find the solid Robert Burns. And there's a kind of irony in that because Burns' promiscuity, stay with me on this, also included a promiscuous sympathy. It's the Adam Smith 
influence again. And that promiscuous sympathy meant that on the one hand, he could sympathize with and write a song about Mary, Queen of Scots. A lot of controversy in a film a few years ago where she's speaking in Scots. Burns is the first person to make her speak Scots. Mary, Queen of Scots, a despotic, Stuart, Catholic queen, a woman, and Burns is sympathizing with her at one end of the spectrum. And at the other end, following the French Revolution, Burns writes the Solemn League and Covenant, a small poetic squib that says, don't mock the Covenanters. Down to the Enlightenment period, the Covenanters, those harsh 17th century Calvinists who said, we're not going to let the king or anyone tell us how to worship, we may follow our conscience, they were written off as fanatics. Enlightenment historians begin to revise that and say, let's, let's, look at, let's get inside their mind, let's be a bit sympathetic. And Burns in the Solemn League of Covenant writes about these guys and gals uh, and says, um, following the French Revolution, these also were people who represented freedom and conscience. So the Covenanters at one end, Mary Queen of Scots at the other. Burns knew there was more than one way of being Scottish, historically and otherwise. Promiscuous in his sympathy to different parts of historic Scottish identity. Now I want to take just a wee detour for a moment to exemplify uh, again Burns's uh, Enlightenment scientific thought. What we get um, in even a seemingly very simple song like A Red Rose is the influence of the pioneering geologist James Hutton. And the lines that have been noticed by a number of people where it's quite clear that Burns has been aware of Hutton who's been around for a while, but especially from 1785, is publishing in various periodicals and academic proceedings his idea about the earth. Hutton especially is interested in deep time. He is a forerunner of 19th century geological thought that says the world wasn't made just a few thousand years ago. Hutton thinks that the, the, the processes that have shaped the earth continue to shape it and are ongoing, even though we can't really see these with the naked eye. And he suggests, more or less, that the Earth is constantly changing geologically and otherwise. And it's quite clear that Burns picks up on this idea when he talks about his love enduring, till all the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. It's a kind of joke, you can say that will never happen, but he knows it will happen. But I won't be around to see it, and you can't come back and say you didn't love me long enough. But that Hutonian idea is another small example of where Burns is appropriating the thinking of the Enlightenment. We get a bit of this again in one of his most famous texts, never published in his lifetime, sort of, of I'll come back to that, Holy Willie's Prayer. And Holy Willie, who is supposedly ostensibly praying to God, but is actually kind of praying to himself, saying how great he is, says, you know, how come I'm so great? You know, at one point he says, why is it that you're making me a sinner? Why is it you're making me a fornicator and a drinker? I'm a bit puzzled by this because I'm so good. He says, ah, I know what it is. It's in case I get too proud. Um, I've got my sins as well. So lucky old Willie gets to know that he's superb. He's one of the elect. He's maybe saved. And also he can enjoy his sins. And obviously there's a broad comedy, but also a subtle psychology in this text. And at one point, speaking to God, Willie says, what was I or my generation that I should get such exaltation? I who deserve most just damnation for broken laws, 6,000 years ere my creation pro Adam's cause. And this is the received wisdom worked out by an Anglican bishop from his reading of the Bible that the world had uh, been created um, about 6,000 years ago. And what Burns is doing here, because he knows that Hutton is beginning to suggest it must be, must be much older than that, he's got Willie being all smug. I keep up with developments. I know the, the world is 6,000 years old. I'm on it. I'm a, I'm a modern man. And of course, Burns is taking the pee out of that idea. You know, the supposedly learned Willie 
is not learned at all. So again, um, enlightenment ideas being deployed within his poetry. Now, I want to say a wee bit more about Holy Willie's prayer in a specific context vis-a-vis -vis Scottish thought. And with regard to what I mentioned at the outset, the Kilmarnock edition, poems chiefly in the Scottish dialect, published on the 31st of July, 1786. 612 copies are made, and a very good copy these days would be worth anywhere between probably 50 and 80,000 pounds. There are 84 copies remaining in the world, as far as we know. And as I mentioned, your previous president from a century and a bit ago owned one of the most sensational copies. Poems chiefly in the Scottish dialect is very important for not containing Holy Willie's Prayer. Holy Willie's Prayer was written by Burns in 1785 and it's a party poem. Burns is acting on behalf of the Ayrshire Enlightenment. That's a phrase, whenever I use that, I've got a friend who shouts for winning at me, uh, um, as if to disprove there could be any such thing, but I'll, 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 I'll pass over that. Holy Willie's Prayer is a poem that according to Burns, in manuscript, goes around the country and people use it, read it, and laugh at the hardline Calvinists the Holy Willies, because the Holy Willies had pursued um, some of Burns's friends. Gavin Hamilton, the lawyer, a man to whom one of the poems in the Kilmarnock edition is dedicated, had been accused of lax church ascendance and perhaps also financial misappropriation by elders like um, William Fisher, and Burns also drags um, William Ault as minister into it as an example of old-fashioned thinking. Holy Willie's prayer is about the old-fashioned Calvinists who are not knowledgeable and who are vindictive and nasty and rely on predestination rather than the morality that is advanced by Francis Hutchison and that line of philosophy. Um, so there's a kind of composite willy. That's a phrase I, I really shouldn't utter when I'm talking about Robert Burns. There's a composite willy in the poem who stands as the old light, or old light hardline Calvinist. And Burns, Holy Willie's Prayer, it's a big hit in the countryside. And as a reward for defending men like Gavin Hamilton and Robert Aitken, to whom the volume overall is, is dedicated, these guys take out over 100 subscriptions themselves out of the 612 to make poems chiefly in the Scottish dialect happen. If we look at what happens with that subscription list, it's the heirs of enlightenment. It's shopkeepers, it's lawyers, it's teachers, it's whisper it, it's middle class folk who are making that book happen. And Robert Burns is grateful to that moderate middle class Ayrshire Enlightenment, and the payoff is, you know, for his service in Holy Willie's Prayer and some of the other Kirk or religious satires. The Freemasons also claim, I think with some justification that they're involved, or there's a lot of overlap between these middle class guys and Freemasonry, they say that, you know, um, contributions were taken up at lodges and so on, but whenever I ask Freemasons about this, they can never actually give me the evidence, or maybe they don't want to give me the evidence. But Freemasonry is also important in Burns's life as part of 18th century thought, and I'll say a couple of things about that presently. So we've got the Kilmarnock edition, um, a product of the moderate Ayrshire Enlightenment, and the other thing that we should say, which is quite interesting about Burns, and here I'm going to be a wee bit heretical again, although actually the facts are quite plain. In 1786, one of Burns's Kirk satires is the ordination. And in the ordination, he berates the Kilmarnock Wabsters or Weavers who want to elect their own minister. And he says of these Weavers, they're a rough lot, they're drunk on brandy, and they're also drunk on scripture. They're fanatics. How dare they want to elect their own minister? Now, this might seem odd to a lot of people who are into Burns, 
because this is Burns at this point, quite far away from being the poet of the people. He's the poet against the people in some senses. And the ordination, which again, like Holy Willie's prayer, lambasts the hardline Calvinist mentality, is actually a piece of propaganda. And like a lot of propaganda, it's unfair. And I'll tell you precisely why. Because these weavers in Kilmarnock and Irvin and that area, we now know are at the forefront of abolitionism. They're among the first in Scotland to protest against slavery. In other words, these weavers, yeah, they're quite hardline Calvinists, but progressive politically. What was Burns objecting to? He was objecting to them electing their own minister. In other words, Burns, as part of the middle class, moderate heirs of enlightenment, we've got the moderate party, we've got the popular party, the popular party of the hardline Calvinists, the moderates are the guys that, that Burns throws his lot in with. The moderates believe in the 1712 Patronage Act, which says we're not leaving it to the hoi polloi to appoint ministers, it's the landowners and the heritors, because they've got the education and they've also got the property and they've been taxed. And that's one uh, way in which you kind of frame representation if you're a property owner, which in the 18th century seemed like common sense. The 1712 Patronage Act, you know, I'm going to be very controversial, is more important than the 1707 Act of Union that everyone bangs on about. People are still fighting over the Patronage Act down to at least the 1920s. Burns at this point is very much in favour of the Patronage Act. Don't leave the people to appoint their ministers. So what changes that attitude to some extent? I'll try and tell you that um, uh, shortly. But before we do that, I want to say a bit more about religious controversy and the very dark history of this institution in which we're now sitting. Thank God the principal's on tomorrow night and not tonight. William McGill is a minister in air. And in 1786, the same year that Burns produces his poems chiefly in the Scottish dialect, William McGill produces a book called Practical Essay on the Divinity of Jesus Christ. And the hardline Calvinists go bananas because according to them, he doesn't say enough about salvation and the sacrifice on the cross. It's all wishy-washy morality and so on. And the hardline Calvinists actually raise an action against McGill for heresy. And this rumbles on to at least 1790. And McGill is a great friend of Robert Burns. And in a number of places, Burns defends uh, William McGill, who really is, you know, he's being pursued by quite a vindictive pack of hardline Calvinists. Um, as late as 1789, his song, The Kirk's Alarm, um, satirical song, refers to a man called William Peebles, that's Poet Willie. Poet Willie, Poet Willie, ye the doctor of Ollie, because William Peebles, the other minister in here, two clergymen fighting, who would have thunk it? William Peebles is one of the pack who are out for the blood of William McGill for his 1786 heresy, supposedly. And Burns satirizes William Peebles in the Kirk's Alarm. William Peebles is the man who in 1811, publishes a pamphlet called Burnomania. And everyone thinks it's like Beatlemania. Um, Peebles is just talking about the fanaticism of Burns. Well, there's some truth in that. But the reason that Peebles publishes this, he wants to say to Scotland, don't you remember this poet? He's immoral, he's a drunkard, don't celebrate him. That went well. Um, but Burnomania is precisely 15 years or so after, 14 years after Burns' death, the hardline Calvinists remember this and they're pursuing him. And a lot of this was over the McGill case. William Peebles, the other minister at Mayor at, at Ayr, and his colleagues produced pamphlet after pamphlet. And the course against McGill goes through different stages in the Church of Scotland until eventually, more or less in 1790, the General Assembly kicks it out. And a wee interesting thing, just to put a wee bit of heresy in there, I discovered a couple of years ago, the lawyer, the main lawyer for those looking to prosecute William McGill was Thomas Muir of Hunters Hill. 
the supposed apostle of democracy. And um, Alex Salmond in the past has not liked me saying this because he wants uh, Burns and Muir to be two peas in a pod. Well, they're not because Muir is popular party and Burns is moderate party. But both sides in some ways are enlightened. Thomas Muir is genuinely interested in democracy, is sent to Botany Bay for 14 years in the 1790s, is progressive in all kinds of ways, but religiously, he's quite conservative. So there's more than one enlightenment. There's a hardline Calvinist enlightenment attacking slavery, um, foregrounding the case for democracy, and there's the moderate enlightenment, which is conservative politically, but morally less uptight. And that's the bit that Burns belongs to, at least to begin with. The thing I always say, just to really irritate people, that if we do a wee bit of counterfactual history, Burns in 1795 joins the Dumfries militia because he's fearful as others are that the French might invade. And Thomas Muir was in France eventually in the late 1790s. And if Burns had lived a couple of years longer, and if the French had invaded, and their intention was to invade and to install Thomas Muir as the first first minister of Scotland, then Burns would have been shooting at Muir. We shouldn't be scared of these different aspects of Scottish culture, these different aspects of enlightenment, indeed these different aspects of religious identity. So that religious controversy over how we see ourselves morally, how we couch theological and moral thought is very much part of the fabric of Burns's poetry. And that's an enlightenment debate. And it gets very vicious here at the University of Glasgow. And I'm probably going to draw a veil over that. One of, the, one of the biggest nutters in this whole thing is John Anderson, the professor of natural philosophy, who quite rightly is seen as the founder of the University of Strathclyde. I better be very careful at this point. Um, Anderson leaves money for what becomes the Andersonian Institute, which becomes the University of Strathclyde. And the University of Strathclyde quite rightly point to a phrase in Anderson's will that says, this will be a place of useful learning. Great, what's not to like? The phrase that they never boast about is that Anderson also says, and the new place is going to be a sound seminary. It's not going to be one of those backsliding, moderate Presbyterian places like the University of Glasgow. It's going to be hardline Calvinist. Now, Strathclyde never ended up like that, but that was kind of what Anderson was looking for. Those are the days when the professor, he was professor of divinity at one point, as well as professor of natural philosophy. And um, he had a square goal with two other professors and he attacked one of his students with a spike. These would, these would be HR issues these days. But in the 18th century, things were much more lax. John Anderson is a big influence on Thomas Muir, and Anderson and these professors at the University of Glasgow don't make much like Burns for those reasons of religious thought. Now, um, I'm sure you're, I'm going to do some book history very briefly. Let's get really boring about it. I showed you before, very briefly, the title page of Poems Chiefly in the Scottish Dialect, published by John Wilson, the printer in Kilmarnock. And it was only recently, in fact, it was the American scholar who told me about your president in 1901. He's got a great nose for sniffing out things. This man discovered that the one version of Holy Willie's Prayer that appears in Burns's lifetime, a chapbook version in 1789, which we all thought was unofficial, was pirated, was almost certainly licensed by Burns. How do we know this? Because the ornament on the chapbook version of Holy Willie's Prayer is an upside down version, you can't see this very well, of, yeah, it's really quite difficult to see, of the Kilmarnock edition. In other words, this is from Burns's own printer. We now know this was printed by John Wilson. Ergo, it comes with the imprimatur of Robert Burns himself. Why does it appear in 1789? Burns wants his poem back out there, his greatest hit back out there, but it's nothing to do with me, but it's out there. He wants out there because 1789 is when Thomas Muir and the others are at the high point of prosecuting William McGill. So these religious wars are there for a long time. It's not just that Burns is attacking religious hypocrisy. That's how we tend to read Burns these days, stripped of that full historic context of religious history. 
we should realize that Burns is a party poet on one side that might not always be completely right. So just to bring that back into view in terms of 18th century thoughts. There's Muir of Hunter's Hill, there's Anderson. I've argued recently with a colleague that um, there's the famous story of Burns sending cannons to France, which is highly improbable for all kinds of reasons, but we found a letter <coughs> where Anderson is offering the French a cannon. And we think what's happened is that Anderson, scientist, the gun maker, among other things, that legend of Anderson sending guns to the French has been stripped off him and sellotaped onto Burns, because that's the kind of thing that happens with Burns, uh, the Superman, or as my friend Donnie Rope says, the Superman. Um, this, these, are, these are the way in which kind of myths accrete and uh, are sellotaped to people. Now, just to move towards an end in terms of thought in the 18th century, what is it that sort of changes Burns' ideas? And I've mentioned this already, his celebration of the Covenanters as representatives of freedom and conscience, in a sense of egalitarianism, brotherhood. It's the French Revolution. And there is a Burns before and after 1789. Burns was to some extent, not all that much influenced by Thomas Paine, who's on the screen, when Paine is the architect of the American Revolution. Paine is one of the giants of 18th century thought in providing the underfelt both for the American and the French revolutions. His pamphlet, Common Sense, not to be confused with work on common sense by Thomas Reed, is mass produced, 100,000 copies, go to George Washington and his troops and others around. It's part of the propaganda that allows the Americans to take heart against the Brits. The Americans are told by Thomas Paine, among other things, no taxation without representation, not that he meant that. Thomas Paine says, you don't need a king or a queen or monarchy. Basically, what you need is a kind of democracy, and you don't need property either, apropos of the earlier part of the discussion. Pain, in other words, is at least a proto, and before long, a full Republican. And it's that Republicanism also that allows him, when he writes The Rights of Man in 1791, to respond to and further the intellectual context of the French revolutionaries who killed their king, and Paine is blowing them up in general terms by saying, you don't need royalty. Everyone is royal, the royalty of man, which is a phrase that comes up again in Burns. And in one of the most famous songs, is There for Honest Poverty, A Man's a Man for All That in 1795, we see some clever stuff coming together that sums up where Burns is in terms of 18th century Scottish and indeed Western thought in general. And he's very clever because he's an excise man at this point. He works for the British Crown. He needs to be careful. And the poem appears in newspapers and it's set to a Jacobite tune. So you can say it, it's a Jacobite tune. It's not revolutionary. It's also couched in Freemasonic terminology that man to man the world over, so brothers be for all that. Not me, Gov. It's a Freemasonic song. It's not a political song. It's a Jacobite Freemasonic. But it's quite clear that the vocabulary of pain is inside there about uh, each individual uh, being all the royalty that you need. It is Burns' hymn to democracy following the French Revolution. It is the point when noticeably, uh, or even a wee bit before this, um, he is less hard line in his um, ideas about patronage. He believes much more in democracy. Before 1789, he didn't have the vocabulary of the French Revolution and of pain. That's what he gets. So whisper it isn't just his innate Scottish uh, populist demotic uh, common sense, because the Scots are just like that, unlike the English, etc., etc. These stupid myths that we get. A lot of this is coming from the republicanism of Thomas Paine. Was Burns a Republican? We can discuss that potentially in a moment. 
There's a lot of complicated debate around that, but certainly Burns is expressing democratic, borderline Republican ideas, which means that we've gone all the way from the 17th century internecine religious wars, civil war, including, and ideas about patronage all the way to the end of the 18th century, where Burns is very much the modern man, and quite rightly, as he's often acclaimed to be, a poet of democracy uh, and of individual rights. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Now, wasn't that fascinating? In a moment or two, we're going to start the Q&A. So if you have your questions ready, could you be raising your hands, please? Do we have any questions? Yep. The man in the blue jumper here. Hello. Uh, could you say a bit more about Burns and slavery? Is, is it the case that he almost took a job in the uh, Caribbean? And how would that fit in with the Enlightenment views? Uh, I'll need to be very careful. I'm doing uh, GB News on this on Tuesday, and I see that Sir Tom was going off on one in the Herald yesterday. I say that with affection about this issue. Um, it is indeed the case that Burns thought about going to be a bookkeeper, and sometimes people say that gets him out of jail. It doesn't. In a letter in 1787, Burns proves that he knew exactly what he was going to be said. I was going to be a Negro driver. So Burns, at a certain point, when he felt his prospects here were diminished, like many well-educated, reasonably well-educated young Scottish men, saw the possibility of making a fortune in the West Indies. That's the naked version of it. And in a sense, there's no excuse for that, except to say that everyone in that society, and arguably down to the present day, as we're now seeing, is complicit one way and another in that slave economy. So he certainly thinks about doing that, but the great thing, that annoys the people that really want to nail him is, he didn't he go? Why didn't he go? There's a lot of mystery around this. But again, it's 1786 when he seems to be thinking of going there with Mary Campbell, Highland Mary, and there's a lot of controversy and mystery around that. He keeps booking his passage and never showing up for the ship. I'm not sure he really wanted to go for various reasons. But again, 1786, this is when his political ideas are still maturing and he hasn't yet had the French Revolution. You look at the French Revolution and the period after that, that's when we begin to get Burns' interest in songs like The Slave's Lament. So we see something that's clearly sympathetic towards the plight of the enslaved. That said, I think we would also say objectively, in some ways, Burns isn't hugely interested in the issue. Maybe he's not all that well informed. Uh, he doesn't go there as much as some other writers, including some right-wing writers. The One of the ones that I always quote is a little-known poet, William Campbell, who hates the French Revolution, who publishes in the Glasgow Herald in the 1790s, who's party to the building of the infirmary, very charitable, uh, very active citizen of Glasgow. He writes against slavery much more fully than Burns does. So that's where we are uh, with Burns. And you're right, it doesn't fit in with his radical CV all that well. Certain other things don't either, to be honest. Uh, but he certainly thinks about going to the plantations, uh, as many others did, including for a time his, the first editor of his work, James Curry, who publishes the first collected Burns in Liverpool, Curry had been part of that, and Curry became quite a radical figure uh, in favour of the rights of prisoners of war and other kind of lefty pinko causes. So people can change their attitudes. And the other thing where we get into quite deep water is we all think we know we're on the right side of history. We're quite smug in the 21st century. What we've got to realise in the 18th and 19th centuries, down to the development of German higher criticism of the Bible, 
Blackness was a problem for white folks because they took it as red that some disaster must have happened to make people black. And they read this in Old Testament terms. So even some of the people who were against slavery still saw black folk as lesser human beings. That's the, that's the rather horrible reality, but one we shouldn't shy away from. And it's when German higher criticism comes along and says, don't read the Bible literally, that people begin to say, yeah, thank God we're free from all that racist and other nonsense. But the whole idea of racism uh, and of developing idea or right ideas about kicking racism out, these in many ways are only becoming fully fledged in the 20th century. And to a large extent, it's even a post-Holocaust phenomenon. What's happening in here tomorrow night? The commemoration of the horrible Holocaust. We held on as Western civilization to the most disgusting racist ideas for a long time, and we still haven't got rid of them. So we need to be careful um, about judging historical figures in the 18th century. We face up to the truth, what's and all, but we should always be aware of the kind of um, the dodgy thinking that lurks um, in our, all of us and even down to the present day. And the Enlightenment was interested in that too. The Enlightenment knew that we could be civilized and also very primitive, very visceral. The Enlightenment said more often than being rational, we're emotional, but that can come with a price. It comes with the price of prejudice, of racism, sexism, all of those kind of things. So I think we should be very careful about our own place in history. I want to read history, not judge it, or at least I don't want to judge it definitively as absolutely good or bad, not least when we never know the full circumstances. So that's not an attempt to get Burns off the hook. He doesn't deserve to be off the hook, but we need to see Burns and his attitudes um, in the round. When I wrote an essay on this more than 10 years ago, I get quite a bit of uh, anonymous phone abuse uh, telling me what a, an effing he I was for, for daring to, to raise this topic. And at that point, I know I'm doing my job properly. God help us. Hello, Jitsun. Hello. 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 A simple but difficult question. If you were to recommend just one book to cover this period, what would it be? Oh my goodness. Um, there are different tastes and different things you, you, you might look at, but I would, I would recommend if you want to go in uh, to some depth, um, The Cambridge History of the Enlightenment edited by Alexander Brody, but there are many other books that you can, that you can follow on from, from that. There are studies of Smith and Hutchison and, and, and others. Um, but yeah, I would, st I would start with the, the work of Brody, lovely man that he is, and a dear colleague. Other, other, other versions are available. There's a gentleman over there with his hand up, but not his arms. Yep. Oh, sorry. A woman, sorry. I thank you for your talk. Um, I'm probably showing up my complete ignorance of my uh, uh, the the church I was brought up in. But in his poem "Epitaph to a Friend," you know those lovely last two lines there. If there's another world, he lives in bliss. If there is none, he made the best of this. Was that kind of a common? Would would he be unusual in saying if there's if there's another um, world he lives in bliss. One of the reasons that Robert Burns is able to say to that is uh, able to say that is because his successful career as a poet and even as an exciseman to some extent allows him cultural mobility. Had he stayed in the one place in Ayrshire, that would have been quite dodgy to say because that expresses the possibility that God doesn't exist. Now I think that Burns sincerely believed in God. I think the evidence points towards that, but he has these moments where reading David Hume or Adam Smith, who was probably an atheist, or others, he entertains doubt. And in a way, that's quite an optimistic um, poem, because it says, if there's God, a God, it's a benign God. And again, that's part of his, his kickback against the hardline Calvinists. If there isn't a God, things are still worthwhile, because there's love, etc. 
So he's expressing views there that are not entirely typical, but have their roots in a book produced by his father, William Burness, for him and his brother Gilbert when they're young boys, a manual of religious belief. William Burness was not a hardline Calvinist, although he, he, he really didn't like his son going dancing. He thought that would lead to, no, we're not doing that joke, uh, or the other way around. Anyway, you know where I'm going. Um, but what, what, what William Burness thought was that um, basically you couldn't pin faith down absolutely. That was a wee bit heretical. You know, you couldn't get everything from the good book. The good book was the good book and it was useful, but very often you had to interact with the world and judge it. And that's kind of what Burns is saying there. And they are rather lovely thoughts. And I, you know, I think, great, you know. If there's if there's God, if there's a God, I want him to be a good God. And if there's not a good God, I want humans to be good to be good. And that's essentially what he's saying there. Uh, the gentleman here, his hand up. Hmm? Who's that? Thanks. Keep it on. Thanks very much. Great talk. Short question. Did Burns change his attitudes towards the French Revolution, given the way it played out? Yeah, well, I think what you're probably rightly referring to there is some of the controversy over what Burns believed. During World War I, William Will, who was the president of the London Burns Club, rediscovered an important document. And that document was the minute book of the Dumfries Volunteers. And the long-standing idea that you still get by the, the most hardline lefties, apropos Burns, is he never really wanted to be in the militia. He only went in there to, to, as, a, as a kind of cover. Um, but what the minute book revealed was that Burns was one of the few guys who was never fined for misbehavior. He was always on time. His buttons were always well polished. He liked being a soldier because it was quite a good look with the lassies, for one thing. And during World War I, this was very emotive because William Will says, here we have definitive proof that Burns was a true patriot. Now, you need to unpack that a wee bit. This is during World War I, uh, the carnage involving Britain, Germany, and all these other countries, and people are losing relatives all the time. And William Will, well, he published it just after World War I, amid this very emotional context, is saying, don't doubt that Burns was a true patriot. But what does that mean? And Burns was used in recruiting posters in World War I and beyond. Well, what he was patriotic about in the Dumfries Volunteers was protecting Britain from invasion by, from France. But I don't think his ideas had changed. He still basically believed in the basic tenets of the French Revolution. But a very basic um, truth is that invasions are never a good thing. Even the good guys coming in to invade is a bit scary. When I was a member of student CND many years ago, I remember having a recurring nightmare. I was in Queen Street and suddenly Soviet troops would come down each side and it was a really scary dream. And I kind of wondered what that was about, but this kind of relates to that. I mean, I was never particularly pro-Soviet, but the idea that just because you agree with certain foreign politics, you'd like them to come in and start uh, um, marching all over you is, is a different reality. And also what Burns was aware of, Edmund Burke in many ways got it right. Edmund Burke called the French Revolution out not long after it happened and said, this is going to lead to madness and carnage and fanatical violence. And in some ways it did. So there are all, all these complexities around that. And Burns, when he was in the exercise service, and again, people say, oh, he, was, he, he never wanted to be in there. Burns had a great time in the exercise service. He was with a bunch of like-minded men who all, as we all do, we need to be very careful here, think their bosses are idiots. I don't think my bosses are idiots. <laughs> um, and they would ride around the country. He'd be collecting songs, spoiling the folk of the, com uh, the, the fun of the common folk who wanted to um, distill illicit beer or, or, or spirits or whatever. And you look at those excise guys, many of whom joined the Dumfries volunteers, they're all political lefties. So just because they're in there doesn't mean they don't retain a progressive political mentality. So that's the kind of thing we get. Uh, Going, going on there. There's, there's this sort of false 
thing about, oh, when he joined the Room Priest Volunteers, he recanted. No, he didn't. But equally, he wasn't welcoming the French to invade. Interestingly, the Ulster Scots poets, uh, Protestant, Protestants and Catholics who are part of the United Irishmen that end up in the failed rebellion of 1798, when the Dupriest Volunteers song gets into the Ulster Press, they all take the view, our boys sold us out. Burns was their poster boy, and at that point, they don't like him. But remember how the Dupriest Volunteers ends, although we'll sing God save the king, we'll never forget the people. And that word, the people, was synonymous with the friends of people founded by Errol Gray in the 1790s as a movement for non-violent reform. And so for Burns to signal that word people, even though it was a non-violent movement, by the time we get to the 1790s, the British government are terrified of the people. That's a French idea. It stands for democracy. Uh, democracy and the people, these are words almost like Al-Qaeda, so far as the 1790s British authorities are concerned. So the Ulster radicals, who were usually quite smart men and good poets, they didn't quite read that carefully enough. And again, as with a man's a man, it's coded. Burns is often very coded. And that's where the idiots that want Burns to give us, you know, straightforward political polemic. He's a poet. He's not really a polemicist. And often he is subtle and coded. So we need to read him with a bit of nuance, both in his lifetime and in the text that he produces. Is the lady up here? Yes. Should have gone uh, to got a hand up just now. Um, you started off your um, lecture with that um, seven, 90, 1893 picture. Mm -hmm. Right, sorry. You started off your lecture yeah. with that 1893 painting um, of Burns and um, Sir Walter Scott allegedly meeting when Walter Scott was 15 years old, but that um, the whole purpose of the picture was to place them both within the same Enlightenment movement. Yeah. And you said that... Um, Burns' reputation after that had changed um, into more of a folk poet. Yeah. You did say you would say a bit more about that later, but I'm not sure that All you, right, okay. I'm not sure that you did. Yeah. Um, and how much of that is due to us, you know, you just gave an example of him being used on a recruiting porter poster and um being, you know, there is a representation of patriotism um in the First World War. But how much of the change in his reputation from that what that picture tells us is due to the way that we're looking back and reinterpreting history by the ideas of our times. OK, thank you for that. Um, so the, what the painting shows, as you say, is Burns and Scott together. And one of the points we might make about that is that Burns and Scott are very similar. And again, the Bampot version of Scottish cultural history doesn't want to know this. Burns good, Scott bad. Nationalist. Uh, unionist, um, man of the people, Tory. But both Burns and Scott are doing the same thing. They're both antiquarians. They're both disinterring folk culture, folk song, which in itself is an Enlightenment project. And at the time that painting is made in 1793, Scotland is proud of all that. Later on, as some critical narratives evacuate the Enlightenment as a good thing, they want something more authentically folk. And that is part of the reason that Burns becomes ever more seen as a folk poet. But the other thing I might throw in here is something I alluded to. Burnomania in 1811. Burns, in many ways, was unpopular in his lifetime. Certain circles liked him, but you're, you're, uh, lots of these Calvinist congregations hated him, and with some justification. And it's only really when we get into the 19th century and beyond, and the Burns movement, largely sculpted by the moderate Presbyterian, the Reverend Hamilton Paul, and Burns' celebration takes on quasi-Masonic uh, forum down to what we have in the present day. It's in the 19th century that Burns begins to become the poet of Scotland in a way that he never was in his lifetime. Suddenly, he's seen as a poet for all Scots, and that's kind of justified, but in his own day, the hardline Calvinists, who were perhaps the majority, 
really didn't fancy him much. So Burns's popularity increases through the 19th century. And for instance, our great Mitchell Library acquires a Burns collection in the 1880s. And if you look at Burns collecting, Burns becomes a respectable subject for collecting round about the 1870s onwards. And that accelerates through into the 20th century. And you can see the construction of Burns, the poet of the people, Burns, the folk poet, but also, it's a wee bit complicated, Burns, the Masonic poet, Burns, the other thing. So the reputation does shift. And you're right, we read Burns through the lens of our own ideas. This happens time and time again. He was a Jacobite. Why was he a Jacobite? People puzzle over this. What they don't notice is that being a Jacobite in favour of the Catholic Charles Edward Stuart, that was so guaranteed to go up the noses of the hardline Calvinists. That's part of the reason he's a Jacobite. And it's also, he quite liked the romantic, naughty boy reputation, and he liked to parade again his promiscuous sympathy in inventing the Jacobite folk song. The Jacobites, like Mary Queen of Scots, they were losers, they were fanatics, a bit like the Covenanters, they were out the picture. What have we got today? Jacobite culture is at the mainstream heart of Scottish folk culture and even political culture. So that the SNP and not only the SNP will refer to Jacobite songs. So all these bits of marginalized history are brought in from the cold by Burns and Burns himself over time he didn't just arrive and everyone went, hooray, it's Robert Burns. They arrived and they went, oh, no, not him. We don't like him. And over time, his popularity increases and also changes. And we're coming full circle now where people are making asinine comparisons with sex pests and claiming that it was a rapist. And they do this on the basis of the horse litter letter. I may as well go for this one now. And that's the one where he boasts about having sex with his wife, Jean Armour, um, on the barn floor. And people say that was rape because he's so joyous. Well, the question I've got for the people that claim that is rape is he also says in that letter, we did it until she cried out for joy. Are these people telling us that rape victims enjoy being raped? Because that's the logic of that piece of evidence if they want to claim that's rape. This is modern day, um, overzealous sexual morality taken to the extent of bullshit. And we need to call that out and do the history properly. Uh, I'll avoid that one in GB News, I think. Precisely because precisely they love it. Do we have an online question? Question at the very back. Thank you. Um, that was... Uh... An excellent talk. Um, if I may be cheeky and actually ask two questions. Um, one is on the en Enlightenment, where we focused obviously in the UK and uh, looking at West. But in my experience, um, uh, just talking to Russians and indeed Ukrainians that I know, I mean, Burns has had a huge influence over there, probably jettisoning some of the local moderate and populist, Calvinist stuff own route and I, any comments you have on that i would appreciate the other is maybe slightly more technical but lord kynes uh, who was also a big scottish um uh, figure at that time wrote this book called equity because he's a jurist i think a lot of people think it's about equity as in english law which is irrelevant but it was a lot about social justice and i be interested in who you think that had any influence on Burns. Yeah, well, I think I caught the first part of that. I'm not so sure about the second, but you can you can maybe re kindly reprise that. Um, one of the interesting things about Burns's popularity in Russia is a it's genuine, but b it's a bit bent, and I'll tell you how. We know from the translations by the likes of Samuel Marshak, who was a great translator in all kinds of ways. Once we look at what was actually being said. We get Burns's folk songs about maybe the Scots against the English, and the Russians do not like that, especially under Stalin. So the terms are changed. Instead of Scots and English, because the Russians are scared of nationalism, they don't want any national descent given the nature of their Soviet empire. Instead of Scots and English, it becomes 
um, proletariat and landlords. They end up distorting the text in many ways. And Burns is amazing in having a reach in Soviet Russia. In fact, a popularity in Russia before the Soviet period, on the one hand, and on the other, held up as a great example by Republicans, and I mean modern day Republicans in America, as an example of the kind of guy, if you've got the talent, you can make it happen, held up as a version of the American dream. And I suppose the point I'm simply making there is that Burns is very portable, is very malleable according to whatever politics you might want. And part of that then is making him an international, indeed a world writer, which he truly is. And some of that is a bit accidental. Some of it is because of the greatness of his writing. Uh, Old Lang Syne is a good example of that, becoming synonymous <clears throat> with New Year, and especially New York. It's because the guy Lombardo dance band adopted it. These things happen accidentally. And because in the age of radio, the technology is there to make him a world writer. So this great poet that I would say is indeed a great poet, we have to be aware of the accidental contingencies of history that transmit reputation and work. Um, it'd be a good enlightenment um, thing to think about genius. The enlightenment was very interested in genius and kind of believed in that to some extent, but also the enlightenment view that genius could be smothered or um, that things might suddenly become all their age, even though they're not worth investing in. So the Enlightenment begins to pioneer ideas of um, civilization and what we value in civilization and some of the stuff we don't value. And Burns at certain points was a wee bit uncomfortable as a celebrity. And of course, celebrity culture is all the rage these days. And the Enlightenment really was a bit skeptical about celebrity. And there's poor old Burns, an Enlightenment poet, finds himself a celebrity, one of the first uh, celebrities. And that curious thing where he's a celebrity in some circles, and as I mentioned earlier, is unpopular in others. Everything is a bit mixed. I'm not sure I caught the second part. Would you try using the microphone, please? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry. I mean, I was talking about Lord Times, who is quite a significant jurist in the mid 18th century. Um, I think his, my view, his biggest work was called equity. And because that can be regarded as a legal concept, it's sometimes just brushed aside as, you know, old law. But it was actually much more, in my view, about, well, what we would now call social justice and equity among human beings. I, mean, I have no knowledge yeah, okay. of whether Burns was influenced by it. Yeah. And I just wondered if you had any uh, yeah. thoughts on that. My, my one response to that would be Burns is very interesting when he satirizes ecclesiastical as well as civil courts in, for instance, the, the fornicator's court in poems like the Court of Equity. He is fascinated by legal vocabulary. And when he gets to Edinburgh in his first blush of fame, he is lionized by men from the faculty of advocates, including William Erskine. So he's imbibing their argo, he's listening to their ideas, he is encountering a lot of lawyers. So church, law, university, all of that stuff is up for grabs. And Burns is like a wee boy in a sweetie shop, especially when he gets to Edinburgh. He wants to think about all of that. And the other thing about Burns, uh, which you know, no one ever says it, but it's patently obvious, Burns is an intellectual, and he's good at taking ideas and expressing them creatively, unlike most writers then or now. Did I say that? I fear I did. Do we have another question from anyone? We're done. <laughs> no? Oh, oh yes, we do. Should have gone to Specsavers. I am not a Burns fan, and I came along tonight to learn, and I have learned, and thank you very much. But the thing that fascinates me is really related to the first question at the back. Why do the Russians uh, admire Burns so much? In fact, they appear to admire him more than we do. 
and they have quite a different culture. They have a czarist culture, and they need a strong leader. And Burns wasn't really in favour of either, was he? No. I think the basic reason, and this goes back to czarist Russia, it's pre-Soviet Russia, Burns so obviously wrote about peasant themes. And Russia was such an overwhelmingly peasant country and was always a bit fearful. Um, and, you know, we go down to the Enlightenment and the time of uh, Catherine the Great and times when Russia is mimicking Western Enlightenment, it's very aware of itself as a peasant culture, as a backward culture. And the West, the Soviet, could often be quite racist towards Russia as a backward peasant society. A bit, the, a bit like the way in which Britain has treated Ireland historically. And I think those peasant themes make Burns of interest and very portable. And that really explains why in the 19th century we begin to get translations of Burns's peasant folk songs, basically. And then, of course, when we get to the Soviet era, he is reinvented as the proletarian poet par excellence. And we can see with poems like A Man's a Man, the way in which those anti-monarchical ideas, as with the French Revolution, suit those who have overthrown uh, the Romanovs, etc., uh, Tsarist Russia. So that's the broad outline of what's going on there, and a lot more could be said. The Russians have them on a stamp before we do, and there is a kind of different cult of Burns there. There's more than one cult of Burns, and there is sincere interest in Burns. I had quite an interesting moment where I'm in very good terms with um, Burns's chief Chinese translator, and I accidentally hit a nerve because he was explaining to me the 10 translators in China since 1945 and what they did. I said, they're clearly taking all this from the, the Soviet translator. Not at all. The Chinese, we've done it all ourselves. We have not looked at all to Russia. And it's kind of interesting the way in which different cultures think that they, to some extent with justification, are producing their own version of Burns. And one of the hot spots just now, I know this because pre-pandemic, I was virtually touring China giving talks on Burns. China is the place where Burns studies is really taking off at the moment, and there's going to be a lot more on that in the future. Now, if I were to be slightly sentimental and sloppy about it, which occasionally I can be, I would say this is because of a kind of innate brilliance in Burns, which I believe is there, an innate attractiveness. But a lot of this is driven by predetermined reputation and the notion that his politics are next door to communism. So that the Indian Communist Party, the Indian struggle against the Brits um, down to the 1940s, uh, Burns has a lot of traction. In Bangladesh, Burns has attraction in their war against Pakistan. He's quite an, an easy off the peg poet of national protest, protest against injustice, because he did write about these things. So it seems to be that he is the most portable poet that we've got because of those political ideas, even though in the 18th century, Burns knew about republicanism, but he's no access to modern ideas of nationalism or socialism. So again, we need to be very careful. No problem with using things for almost whatever you want, almost, but again, we need to keep him in his historical context. And actually, people will use and abuse things, and we can't legislate for that. And uh, we'll, we'll see where else Burns pops up, because he could pop up in other places, in other cultures, in other nations in the future. And it keeps me in a job, so I'm not complaining. Right, now we've got a final question from the man right at the back. Hello. Uh, just to follow on from your, uh, your last answer, is there some relation between Tagore and Burns? I, not, not really, um, except the people that follow Tagore want to make a connection and they're entitled to do that. And again, it's the idea of poets of the people and let's uh, look at them together. For a while in this city, we had the Nazrul Burn Centre celebrating that Bengali poet. And there's been several poets from the Indian subcontinent who've been compared to Burns. And again, you see the Burns effect writing about 
subsistence peasantry writing about supposedly primitive societies, which Burns did with Scotland, because rightly or wrongly, it was often seen as primitive, especially compared to England. So that portability, again, of the peasant theme works quite naturally in the context of poets like Tagore um, and uh, uh, Nazrul uh, and, uh, and others. Now, I'm sure you will all wish to join with me in thanking Jerry for this absolutely fascinating talk. I'm sure we've all learned something. And I think, yes, even those people who knew a lot about Burns before they arrived will have learned from this experience. So if we could thank Jerry in the usual way, please.